I didn't want to like watch the actual delivery, but I wanted video footage of the delivery because there were yeah. 30 people in the delivery room, a doctor for say. every baby, like a, yeah. a, a life support person. It was gnarly. Mm -hmm. um, it was all C-section. I remember they went, they said, there's a boy. And then they said, there's a girl. And then that's the last thing I remember. I kind of passed out after that. I was like, I got, I ended up having two more boys after that, but I had to like check in with my husband when I came to. So <laughs> You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, where we firmly believe in the power of education when it comes to giving birth. Tune in each week as we dive into pregnancy-related topics, expert interviews, and a variety of birth stories. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice. Please see mommylabornurse.com slash disclaimer for more details. And now, here's your host, educator, registered nurse, and fellow mom, Liesl Teen. Hello guys, happy Monday. So this week we have a really special guest. This episode was so much fun to record and I just I just love her. So have you guys heard of Katie Ferraro? She is on Instagram. She's got her own website. She just she does a lot of things, but one of the coolest things about her is that she is a mom of seven. Can you even believe that? Like how cool. If you know anything about baby led weaning, you probably know who Katie Ferraro is. She has a really popular Instagram page called Baby Led Wean Team. I've been following it for a while because I'm very interested in baby led weaning. Um, and we talked a little bit about baby led weaning today, but we more talked about her experience uh, as a mom of seven and multi and a few of those are multiples, mind you. So if you can even believe this, um, Katie has an older daughter. So she has one singleton and then she had quadruplets and then she had a set of twins. So that's seven babies. So she's an amazing lady. You guys are going to love her. She had lots of advice to give on being a mom of multiples and pregnancy when it comes to mom, when it comes to multiples and nutrition. Um, so if you are a multiple mom or if you're just interested in <laughs> what she has to say about multiple pregnancies, um, definitely tune in. Super excited to share this episode with you guys. So let's get started. Are you a mama that already knows you want an epidural? Did you know that childbirth education is still super important to a more confident and powerful birth? It's true. Here at MLN, we know that every mama can benefit from a birth class tailored to their needs, which is why Birth It Up, the epidural series was born. Learn more about how to get educated and totally prepared for your epidural birth at mommylabornurse.com slash epidural birth. Hi, Katie. Welcome to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. Yeah. Well, can you just start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself and your large family? <laughs> and it is large. Where it was you're quick. from? <laughs> yeah, where you're from and what you do and all that good stuff. Sure. My name is Katie Ferraro. I'm a registered dietitian. I'm a mom of seven small children. I actually specialize in baby led weaning. So I I used to work with older adults in nutrition and uh, I've always run a private practice in nutrition and my husband and I decided we wanted to start a family. I was, I think, 36 when that all started and very quickly knew I was going to need um, fertility assistance. I don't even know if that's the proper term. I'm not a fertility expert. It's People sometimes think I am because I have seven kids all from, you know, assistance, assistive yeah. reproductive technology, yeah. but I, I, it's funny. It's like when I was in it, I was so in it. And the second I get out of it, I'm so glad I wrote everything down because people are yeah. like, what meds were you on? Or and I'm like, I yeah. don't remember. I got to write everything down. But we did um, IVF for our first child. Her name is Molly. She's six years old now. And um, about the time that she was starting solids, uh, we were struggling a lot and we were thinking about wanting to do IVF again. Um, we really struggled with picky eating with our oldest and just kind of got a mm. bad, like right off the bat. And then we actually found out we were pregnant with quadruplets. And so wow. we had been doing IVF. So I knew that the likelihood of multiple pregnancy was there, but certainly yeah. not quadruplets. So I can share I'm more sure. about that. But we then went on, we, I wanted one more. We did yeah. IVF and transferred to and got twins. So I have twins who are now three years old. So at one point we had seven kids age three and under. Wow. Now they're six and under. It's still insane, but I feel like 
I feel like I can finally talk about it because it, it's not so like traumatic it's, and triggering. It's not trauma <laughs> anymore. Yeah, yeah exactly. It. Now they're like thriving toddlers who annoy <laughs> me for different reasons. But Oh, well, that is so cool. And I mean, gosh, yeah. How special. I, I want to ask you though, too, like before we, before we talk about what we're, what we're actually going to talk about. So I'm just curious, like what does, what does childcare look like for you with that many children? Who do you um, have to help you? Okay. So you, when, when we have, have anybody, quadru- yeah, I never, so I, when I had one baby, I always worked from home and had my own business. But when yeah. I found out I was pregnant with a quadruplets, and I just want to clarify, cause I know your audience is maybe interested. We did not transfer embryos mm-hmm. for the quadruplets. I, I literally don't know the technical way to say it, but mm-hmm. I was doing fertility medications mm-hmm. for a potential transfer. It was going poorly. I was super stressed in my business. My doctor was like, listen, I only see like three eggs on your ultrasound. I'm not going to transfer. You're going to get zero embryos. You're going to waste a bunch of money. Let's Mm -hmm. just like stop this round, come back. And I was like, so wait, but you see three eggs in there. And she's like, yeah. And I was like, well, then I'm just going to try to get pregnant the old fashioned way. And she's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. but you know, you've been trying that for years. You have diagnosed infertility. And I was like, but you're going to give me that medication that tells me exactly when I ovulate. Right. And she's like, yes, I am. But I need to clarify. There are three eggs in there. If you got pregnant and you got pregnant with triplets like that, Mm -hmm. that's a risk. I was like, it's not going to happen. Went to Santa Barbara with my husband, drank a bunch of wine, (laughs) got pregnant the old fashioned way. What happened was there were really four eggs on the ultrasound and she had only seen three, all four stuck, all four stayed. Wow. Ended up going 34 weeks and gave birth to between two and three pound, three boys and one girl. So people are always like, how many did you transfer? How many did you transfer? I actually didn't transfer. And the best part of it. Not only did I get four healthy babies, I actually got all my IVF money back from my doctor because we never transferred, which then allowed me to do the final round when I had my twins. So um, at the time, I mean, it was the only thing I was thinking about. I was like, yeah. how am I ever going to afford this? And then if I even have these babies, how am I going to afford them? Um, mm-hmm. But as far as childcare goes, um, it it's a lot. I mean, we, yeah. I think we tried when the quads, they came home one by one from the hospital. Thank goodness. And the first night was that was all four of them was Valentine's day night. Okay. And I think it's as close as like we ever came to getting divorced. I was like, how do people do this? Like yeah. my husband was going back to work and I was like, probably never going to work again was what I thought, but like, how am I going to stay up all day and stay up all night? Yeah. So we actually had um, a NICU nurse at our NICU. We came we, we work. So we were in the NICU in the daytime. We would always go at night and we befriended the night NICU nurses. And there was always a lot of interns there, nursing students. Mm-hmm. And so we started talking about like, how, how are we going to do this at night? They're like, Oh, just get a doula or a night nanny. And I started looking and I'm like, doulas and night nannies make more money than like dietitians do. Like there's, <laughs> I'm normal. I can't afford this. It's a and lot. The nurse's yeah. suggestion was like, listen, we have all these nursing students here. They want experience with preemies. Um, they have CPR, they have their vaccines. Cause I'm like in a house yeah. with immunocompromised children. Yeah. We actually reached out to the local nursing school and posted jobs there for night ner- nursing students mm-hmm. who just helped us with feeding. Um, mm-hmm. and that was a huge help because it was much more affordable for us. I could kind of be half awake and feeding two babies while the other one was feeding two babies. And then I could go back to bed for a few hours until mm-hmm. the next feed. So my husband could sleep. So I would say like, nursing students were our jam. Some of whom then That's are now cool. NICU nurses, some of whom have their own babies. Now it's been like so exciting to watch, but um, we really could not afford traditional childcare, especially at night that early on. And especially with that many babies. I mean, wow. Like, no. wow. And, but I but became friends with like grandmas, all the grandmas in my neighborhood. I, be, oh. I would have happy hour. I'm like, if you come over, here's what time we feed. We're on like a really oh. strict schedule. If you oh. come over, I, we have food and drinks, just help me feed the babies. And it was actually a great way to get to know a ton of my neighbors who I hadn't known before. Yeah. Cause I was always working. And now all of a sudden I was home 24 seven. So yeah. I would say like, we kind of leaned on non-traditional ways of getting people to help, but um, yeah. I was open to that, which I know not everyone is. Uh, but I mean, it takes a village, right? There's that it takes a village saying. So, hey, like, I mean, you, you do what you got to do. And I love that you use nursing support, you know, fellow, fellow nurse. So Heck I yeah. love that you're like. Team. And I mean, no respect to <laughs> night nannies and doulas, but like oh, literally no, no, no. the hourly charge. I was like, well, yeah. I could do this one night a week, but then what would I do the other six? So for us, it just yeah. worked at the time. That's actually really smart. And I, I want to start telling people that, but also I want to start telling nursing students that who are interested in like in getting jobs in the NICU, like, Hey, um, I mean, 
try to find some moms who would. Yeah, and I know you're not like, supposed to use your NICU position to poach babysitters yeah. and nurses, but we went through the nursing school. So I'm like, what school are you at? Yeah. And then I called that department and was yeah. like, hey, I know these girls. Can you put a job description up? And then we interviewed a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and I think my suggestion is um, I always thought I would need childcare from someone who had had multiples. Yeah. But the more children I have, my suggestion is you don't want someone else in their bad habits. And I don't want to hear, this is what I did with my other family, my other family. I like nursing students who are a blank slate who are like, what is your schedule? Here is my schedule. Here is how we do things. Cause at yeah. the end of the day, I'm not a nurse, but I am the boss of my family. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I have, we have a lot of family here, so we have help just like with family, but I've heard that from a lot of people in terms of childcare. It's like the, it's, you love like the, the college student who has no kids and you can just say, do this, that, and the other. <laughs> oh, I love a seventh grader that doesn't have a boyfriend. Yeah, or a phone. There you go. <laughs> then they're really a blank slate. <laughs> Start them real early, right? <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I think we should transition. I mean, we've already kind of talked about some of what you're going to talk about today, just your own experience. But um, tell me what it was first. Tell me what was it like to be pregnant with four babies at once after just being pregnant with one baby? I'm glad I had the opportunity to be pregnant with one. I had a vaginal delivery with my first, yeah. um, something I was like, if you know, I don't do that again, I'll be yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, but with the quadruplets, I, I was, I, I hate to say older because I know it's all a matter of context, but I felt like I would like to be done having my children by the time I'm 40. My husband is three years older than me. Yeah. Um, I, um, I had a mom, I'm the oldest of six kids who like, I remember doing stuff with me. I thought like, I don't want to be like in the nursing home when these babies are in grade school. Yeah. So I, I did have a time frame in my head, but I never set out to say I wanted quadruplets. It was sheerly an act of God. And now yeah. I do feel uniquely equipped to do this job. But at the time when I was pregnant with the quads, I was like, well, I was just praying for them to reduce. So yeah. when the first thing you find out when you get pregnant with quadruplets, literally my doctor's jaw dropped on the floor, like all Octomom jokes aside you're not supposed to get pregnant with four babies. No. And she didn't get me pregnant with four babies. My husband got me pregnant with four yeah. babies. But, <laughs> Let's be clear. Um, but when we found out when we were pregnant with quadruplets, I, I made a pact. I never was really much for social media in the first place, but I wasn't going to go online and start looking up stories about quadruplets because um, a specialist that we met with made a very good point. There is a 50% chance of having a major handicap when you have a quadruplet pregnancy. Yeah. And parents of babies with major handicaps don't have pretty blogs of all their beautiful babies. And so right. don't go online because you're self-selecting a story that might not be your own. Yeah. And I really took that to heart. And I, But the 50%, not one for numbers, but the 50% chance of major handicap, like to this day, gives me goosebumps because... Yeah. I then prepared, I said, you know, we, there was a period we, we live in San Diego. My doctor right off the bat was like, a, I can't deal with it. You need to go see a specialist. So she recommended us to a specialist. Um, and I forget what the, the term is, but it's like amniocentesis when you have a, a lot of multiples and they basically would do genetic testing and everything. We traveled to New York. We met with the specialist. Um, and I just thought, I kept hoping at every single check that there would be less than four babies. Like I didn't want to be the one to have to make that decision. Yeah. And that specialist was very blunt, but her recommendation was to reduce down to two. Yeah. And I think it was the hardest decision I ever didn't make, but we ultimately decided not to do a reduction. And I've written a lot um, about our decision not to reduce. I know it's not for everyone. Yeah. Um, and now I'm so glad we didn't. But at the time I was very scared. And I remember going to my 12 week appointment, we had gone on a family vacation. And the whole time I was just like praying that at the 12 week appointment, there would be less than four babies on their own, like that nature would yeah. just take care of itself and yeah. make it a less um, high risk pregnancy. And there was still four babies. And I remember the only time I cried was at that appointment, just yeah. thinking like, oh my gosh, there's a 50% chance of major handicap. So yeah. it was very scary. Um, I, I was scared a lot about, um, you know, and you, as you hear those statistics, you, you, okay, what's the underlying thing there? Well, it's early, it's, it's preterm labor, right? Like yeah. I happen to be five foot 10. One thing I had going for me was my uterus can stretch really far. Have I have a friend yeah. though, who's five foot tall, who went 34 weeks with quads as well. And if I had oh, wow. gone online looking for statistics, she probably would have been like, oh my gosh, I'm five foot. I'll never be able to do it. Yeah. Um, so I really tried to just, I guess, listen to my own body, but knowing that what well, I'm up against time here. They're not going to be in there for 40 weeks or anywhere close to it. Actually, 28 weeks is the average gestation for quadruplets. And so yep. 
That to me was scary. You need to start the weight gain right now. Like I know all about the Institute of Medicine guidelines for recommended weight gain. And I know at triplet pregnancies, they say not enough data. So mm -hmm. at quadruplet pregnancies, like really, really not enough data, like yeah. how much weight do you need to gain and how fast? And so I think the first time I kind of leaned on, I'm a college professor at the University of California at San Francisco. I teach nutrition and I really like leaned on my colleagues to be like, can you guys help me get in touch with the researcher who wrote the IOM guidelines? I I'm pregnant with quadruplets and I really, I'm a dietitian, but I need to know like, what do I really need to do as far as calories and weight gain? And she actually responded to me, which was amazing. Um, and I think even used our vignette in a future edition of a book, just about how to put a meal plan together to eat like 3000 calories a day, real fast out of the gate, just to put that weight on so that if they come earlier, you've done everything you can. Um, yeah. And I never went on bed rest. Ironically, I actually wanted to, cause I had a toddler and I was like, Oh God, please <laughs> let me like rest for 20 weeks. But I, yeah. I would say the last 20 weeks, I didn't move. I sat on the couch. Yeah. I listened to podcasts nonstop. I think my daughter ate mac and cheese, which I have no shame about um, sharing the entirety of my pregnancy, just because I was like, you see that toy on the floor and you're like, am I going to pick it up? Or is this going to make my water break? Like I remember mm -hmm. just being petrified. Yeah. So I pretty much sat still and 34 weeks was as long as they would let me go. Um, mm -hmm. And I do know some moms who've had 34 week quadruplets and they did vaginally deliver, although it's very rare and no doctor in Southern California was going to do very, it for me. And yeah, I, was I did not want to, I was like, you guys do what you want to do. Um, I will do anything to just please get these babies out healthfully. So I didn't, I yeah. didn't find out genders because I didn't want to get attached. We didn't come up with names. Yeah. Um, when I got past the 30 week mark and I have a sister that had a premium, a baby born at 24 weeks and another one at 26 weeks. So mm. I know like the NICU life mm -hmm. and thank God they're fine now, but it was a long road to get there. And I yeah. just, every week I passed past 24, past 25, when it got past 28, which was average gestation, I was like, maybe this is going to be okay. 29. When I got past 30, we actually contacted our local, um, hospital system where we were having the baby and reached out to them um, because they do a documentary series and they followed mm -hmm. the last four weeks of the pregnancy. And then the first year of the life of the babies, which was mm -hmm. cool because I literally wanted, I didn't want to like watch the actual delivery, but I wanted video footage of the delivery because there were yeah. 30 people in the delivery room, a doctor for say. every baby, like a, yeah. a, a life support person. It was gnarly. Mm -hmm. um, it was all C-section. I remember they went, they said, there's a boy. And then they said there was a girl. And then that's the last thing I remember. I kind of passed out after that. I was like, I got, I ended up having two more boys after that, but I had to like check in with my husband when I came to. So it was quite the experience, but going 34 weeks, I think really was nothing short of a miracle, except I know nutrition had a lot to play with it. Yeah. And that's exactly what I want you to dive in next is like what, okay. If somebody's listening to this and let's say they're pregnant with twins, okay. Or triplets or or more like, you know, four or five, how, however many. So what is, I guess, what is the, what are kind of the first steps that somebody would need to do? And, and also like, why do you think it's so important? I think nutrition is so important in a multiples pregnancy because it's one of the few things that you can control. Yeah. I couldn't control that when we got one of the genetic tests back, what is now our daughter, there was some genetic abnormality and I freaked out about it and it was coding for, you know, autism and, yeah. and all this other stuff. And like, I can't control that, but what can mm -hmm. I control? I can control what I eat and I can control the weight gain and just the, uh, I like objective measurements. Like, tell me what my goal is this week. Your goal is to gain three pounds this week. All right. How are we going to do it? Yeah. And to be honest, as a dietitian, like you think about, oh, should I eat salad? Like you throw all that stuff out the window. It came down to calories. Yes. Take your prenatal vitamin, mm -hmm. but your stress levels are high. You're I'm mm -hmm. chasing a toddler, which I shouldn't be, but your activity levels are high. The goal is to have weight gain. Make sure you're getting your baseline nutrients from your prenatal vitamin. Mm -hmm. But the goal is really just a race against time and making sure that you are gaining weight at that trajectory, even when you didn't feel like eating. Because you get yeah. to that point where like, for me, because I'd had a singleton before, I think at about four and a half months, I looked and felt as big as I was when I was nine months. So think about how the end of you that you feel at the end of a pre of a singleton pregnancy, you're so full, you don't even want to eat. There's no room for this food to yeah. go. That's how you feel after like four months with quadruplets. So yeah. it was small, frequent meals, which were really, really important, even when I didn't feel like it. And it wasn't like pickles and ice cream stuff. Just eat another sandwich, even yeah. though you don't really feel like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So tell me what are some of the first things that like somebody should do when, if they're pregnant with multiples and they're concerned about 
weight gain and getting their nutrition on track. Because we say, you know, we preach like start a prenatal vitamin and that's important, obviously, but nutrition is like probably even, you know, much more important than just taking a prenatal vitamin every day. So where would you say, like, what would you say start with? Because sometimes I think it can be overwhelming for people to just, you know, like they say at your provider visit, okay, just, just eat an extra 300 calories a day. And it's like, what does that even, what does it even look like? How do I even do that? And then it's like, oh, I have two or more babies in here. Like what, what do I do now? And oh no, I'm not, you know, gaining my weight this, and, and then it gets overwhelming. So normally as a dietitian, when I'm teaching parents about weight gain, which like always words of caution, like don't gain too much weight right out of the bat. You know, right. we know it's hard, you know, there's, and that is an issue for some women, but even if you have multiple pregnancies, it, once you get twins and above, it's pretty obvious that you need to be gaining weight more quickly because yeah. you're not going to have the full 40 weeks gestation. And our goal is to have the babies be as healthy as possible, as far along in that pregnancy as possible. So yeah. if I can share the resource that was the most helpful to me, because there's so much bogus information yeah. in your field, in my field, on the internet, yeah. um, the best resource for me, the only piece of information I bought was the book called When You're Expecting Twins, Triplets, or Quads, Proven Guidelines for a Healthy Multiple Pregnancy. And that was written by Dr. Barbara Luke, who was on the panel that set the IOM weight gain guidelines during pregnancy. So I was like, cool. go find the lady that does the research. Yeah. And that was the book that I read. And that was it. I remember hiding the book because I hadn't told my family I was having anything more than one. Like they could tell like literally very soon because I started to get big really fast. Yeah. I remember hiding it underneath my pillow at that vacation um, before the 12 month mark because I didn't want them to know I was having more than one baby. But I read that like the Bible because this is the person who did the research on having healthy pregnancy outcomes for triplet and quadruplet pregnancies. So I would say, you know, going to the source, um, asking your doctor if you're confused by guidance, and you got to keep in mind, 95% of physicians in this country have never taken a dedicated nutrition class. Right. So when you get nutrition advice from your doctor, take it with a grain of salt. I think pediatricians and OBs, they're wonderful resources, but not for nutrition information. When they say things like eat 350 extra calories, well, right. what does that look like? What does that mean? Be an advocate for yourself and your pregnancy by asking for a referral to a dietitian who can help you in a sit down, low stress outpatient appointment, mm -hmm. set a meal plan. You don't have to see the dietitian every week. It might just be a one or two time thing, but they can actually give you tangible information rather than just getting a tear off from your doctor that says calories, which you might not know what that means or what those calories should look like. No, I, I mean, I remember even like when my first pregnancy being confused about that and I wish... Um, and I think some OB offices are starting to do this kind of like how they employ a lactation specialist at your pediatrician. I think some OB offices, um, when they can afford it, employ a dietitian on staff. And then it's like a visit that you go or, a you know, with COVID now, it's usually a phone call, but it's, it's like, virtual. Yeah. It's, it's built into your prenatal care to have, you know, a specialist, uh, you know, talk to a, a dietitian and, that needs to keep happening. <laughs> like, I agree. Let's and get I think everybody going. <laughs> you mentioned the cost. And unfortunately, in our current healthcare system, di registered dietitians are not reimbursed for their services in many of those settings. Yeah. And so what's the alternative? Cash pay. Oh, that's too much. I can't afford it. Yeah. But I do want to remind you that um, an appointment with a registered dietitian, you might only need one or two appointments to set out a meal plan. Yeah. And they can set you know, just having the map for me. I remember I had it on my Google calendar every single week, how much I should weigh super weird thing. And I know for a lot of parents, especially if you have a history of eating disorders, that can be super triggering. So yeah, for the moms that do have a history of eating disorder, it's a little bit different. I, I don't personally have that history for me. Putting my weight on my calendar wasn't like my favorite thing to do, but at yeah. least I had a plan so yeah. that I didn't miss a week or two weeks. Because if you're only going to go 28 weeks and you miss your weight gain goals for two weeks, like that's actually pretty major. Right. Right. No, you're absolutely right. Because think there's just less weeks to hit. And if you miss two of them, yeah, that's a really, really good point.
All right, that baby crying means that it is time for this week's segment of Birth It Up Babies. So Birth It Up Babies, if you don't remember last week, Birth It Up Babies is just where I read a little review, a little message that somebody sent me um, through Instagram or email um, of someone that took my course and then had their baby. I get messages all the time on Instagram and put them up on my Instagram story, but I thought it would be cool to read you know, some of them here as well. So this one is from Samantha Rose Moreno. And Samantha says, our birth at a baby is two months old today. My husband and I took your epidural class and your newborn basics class. We love them. I was induced four weeks early and your class helped us arrive educated and especially ready to advocate for my wants. That is awesome. I am so happy to hear that. My husband's favorite part was your advice to make my body relax like a rag doll. All throughout my labor and induction interventions, he would yell, rag doll, Ready, Raggedy Ann. I would giggle and relax, which totally helped. Thank you so much for everything. Oh, that is so sweet. Yay. I just love these. <laughs> so if you are interested in the class that Samantha took, she said that she took my epidural class, birth it up the epidural series, and she also took newborn basics class. So if you just head over to mommylabornurse.com, you click on the epidural series and they also, and we also have information about our newborn basics. So you can head right over there and see the exact course that Samantha took. All right, let's get right back into this week's episode. Well, cool. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking, I mean, I'm a big advocate for like birth education and getting birth education in prenatal visits and like incorporate instead of it being, oh, you should take, you know, a birth course, like let's build it into prenatal care. So like literally everybody gets it. And I think that's you got a lot education. of downtime during your pregnancy, right? Like, yeah. and I even encourage in my audience, so um, I teach baby led weaning and I have a lot of moms on my free baby led weaning for beginners workshop. They're like, I'm pregnant. I'm just kind of like trying to learn. And it's like, that's great. Use yeah. your pregnancy. Some people are like, I'm going crazy because I don't, the baby's not here yet. Use yeah. your time to educate yourself. Cause when the baby does come, it would be nice to think you will have the time to do that. And you do have time still to do things. Newborns do sleep a lot, but yeah. you have different priorities then. So I think, yeah, using your pregnancy as a time to educate yourself about breastfeeding, about birth, yeah. about nutrition, about even infant feeding. It's six months yeah. away, but it's going to come quick. You got to put the the seed there. <laughs> Like just to get it in your head, because I think ultimately that helps you not be overwhelmed. You know, there's still, there, I mean, God, God knows, like if you've never used a breast pump before, it's really hard to you to learn about using a breast pump before. Like, yeah, actually. And that's why I tell pumping, like it's, you can, you can learn about it, but like before you actually have your hands on it and you're using it, like there, it's a learning curve, but for yeah, sure planting the seed there is so, so important. So and I if do, you've never done it before, get the expert who does like, I'm a dietitian. I'm always like, I expect people to pay me for my expertise. Like when I had breastfeeding issues, I was like, how do I get a lactation consultant like ASAP? Cause I'm about to give up. Like if yeah. someone doesn't come in here and fix this. Yeah. Did you pump for your multiples at all? Or did you try? I did, so my, so I, I always preface it with, I, I never had a chance to like do the full breastfeeding thing. Yeah. And I lived to talk about it. My <laughs> oldest had um, a lot of nerve damage during her delivery, which uh, you should, I mean, it may have been due to over medication on my part. My doctor was like, if you got to quit hitting that button for more medication, she was literally like, she ended up having nerve damage on her mouth, I think, because it took a really long time for her to come out. And I feel guilty gotcha. about that to this day. Cause she's got a crooked oh. little smile, but it's adorable, but she's not, oh. she could latch perfectly, but couldn't transfer. So from the uh. beginning I was doing SNS and all that. We almost got divorced over that too. Like I, I was like, this is too stressful, but I do want to breastfeed. I yeah. pumped exclusively. And then with the quadruplets, I, I, they, I had a wonderful hospital, baby friendly, super pro breastfeeding, everything, except I didn't want to set a precedent that I couldn't upkeep. I, yeah. I run a business to be breastfeeding quadruplets. I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it. So why even start? And that might not be the right approach for everyone, but it's what worked yeah. for me. I, I pumped like a uh, madman, which helped because I gained over 50 pounds with my quadruplet pregnancy. And I was like, I mean, I gotta be, I gotta be taking care of these babies. I do need to get some of this weight off. So that was helpful. I was actually interested in it for that reason. Of course, yeah. in addition to the nutrition benefits, I only ever made enough for half. So I always thought we always supplemented with formula. So they had half mm -hmm. breast milk, half formula. Like if one was sick, I would like, I would like take the formula out and give that baby a full breast milk yeah. bottle. Like, I don't know if it helps, but I always thought like, gosh, if I go on to have twins, at least I know I make enough breast milk for that. I did have twins when the quads were a year and a half. 
I got pregnant or I had twins, which it's all a blur right now. I tried to tandem feed them. And like my neighbor who had twins came over and taught me. And at Mm -hmm. that point I was running a very busy baby led weaning business with four toddlers. And I hate to say, like, I, I don't hate to say it. I sure people will hear this and be like, I can't believe that's so selfish. I didn't have time to breastfeed them with five other little kids running around. So I pumped for them too. And I'm okay with it. Like, yeah, that's what, that's what worked for me. And I pumped until they were like nine months of age. And then I was like, please, can I be done? And I very gladly, I actually bought the hospital grade pump. Cause after like so many kids, it was worth it. And I gave it to a friend and it felt so good to give away. And to it's, this day, when I so, see like the pumping room at the airport, I'm like, dude, I'm so glad I don't have to go there. Like, yeah, it gives you like bad feelings. No, I'm just, I I'm just done pumping now for, he's not even a year. We're just, we've been supplementing for a couple months now. And yeah, I just kind of allowed myself to stop. And I'm like, this is like, pumping is just it's not fun. <laughs> like I and just, there's like cooler pump stuff now. I feel like than when I had there been, is, but it's still not cool enough for me to want to go back. <laughs> there is, there is. And there's definitely a lot of ways to make it easier and more convenient, but still it's just, there was something I had issues with pumping. This is what my issue was. I would get really overstimulated. So like the pump was just like an extra, Like my kid would be talking to me. I would try to be eating something and pumping and and I'm just like, this is like too much. (laughs) So I'm like, which you wouldn't do if you were breastfeeding, you would like sit and be calm. I know. I feel like you're trying to multitask. I I did get, um, uh, I got pulled over one time when Mm -hmm. I was pumping. I know you're not supposed to drive and pump. You guys don't need to DM me and tell me. Well, it's okay. It's okay. You don't mess with your settings. That's what I I tell people because I've done it before. (laughs) But I was holding my phone. So he like, yeah. first of all, he was like, and I, ju- and I was going to work. So I just had like the cover on. Yeah. So I was like almost naked and getting a ticket. And he was like kind of laughing, but he's like, I'm so sorry. But my wife like definitely does this whole pumping thing too. So I get it. And he was like, trying not to make eye contact. He's like, but you were holding your phone. So I'm going to give you a ticket for that. Not like in de- you were not getting a ticket for pumping. Cause for I'm sure pumping. he's like, lady's going to call like the news and be like, he pulled me over for pumping. I should not have been touching my phone. But I, I mean, you got, I, I used yeah. to pump and drive all the time. Again, yeah. I, I know you're not supposed to do it, but I feel you on like the multitasking thing. But after getting the ticket, I was like, you know what, if I don't have enough time to pull over and pump, like what the heck? Like, yeah, come on. True. True. <laughs> that is too funny. Okay. Well, I want to get into, I, I have two questions that I want to ask you. First one is, Let's go back to weight gain and nutrition and multiple pregnancies. And I want to know if somebody did have um, an appointment with a dietitian at this point, you know, they found out they're pregnant with, with twins or triplets or, you know, quadruplets or whatever, and they have an appointment. What are some of the kind of things that they would be counseled on? Oh, I love this question. I think a lot of people don't know what a registered dietitian does, but they do lots of different things. But in the prenatal environment, their job is to help you meet your nutrition goals for safe and healthy pregnancy outcomes. So I think the first thing is you would discuss goals. Um, There's this perception that dietitians are kind of the food police and they're going to tell me what not to eat. And they're certainly got that reputation for a reason. Um, (laughs) But I would say that the majority of my colleagues are very good at motivational interviewing. They are going to ask you what your goals are Um, because I I would say straight up, my goals are to keep these babies in as long as I can tell me what I need to do. You need to gain this much weight every single week. It's back into how many calories you need. And it is a little bit prescriptive, but for my case, I'm like, I don't care. I just want to do this again, this is the one thing I have control over. So I think you can expect to set goals with a registered dietitian. Um, and then also um, to have them meet you where you're at. It's very different now in the sense that a lot of people have wearable trackable devices where they can keep track of steps and calories and they're used to logging food. Um, it is kind of a numbers game. It takes the fun out of it. But if you really are interested in gaining the right amount of weight, It is a function of how many calories you eat um, and or drink and your micronutrients, which you should be getting from a prenatal vitamin. But I always think the prenatal vitamin is kind of like a little bit of an insurance policy. Like, yeah, it's okay if the quality of my diet takes a dip when I'm pregnant because I got that nice Mm -hmm. prenatal on board to help me with my iron and my folic acid, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, makes sense. No, I love that because I, I think a lot of people just what, you know, it's like, Oh, go see a dietitian. It's like, okay, well, like, what do they even do? Are they going to, cause I think I've heard too, um, people say, well, are they going to like, I hate yogurt. Are they going to make me eat yogurt? No, cause it's good would, for you. 
you know? Nope. We should never, just like an infant feeding, we never force right. a baby to eat a food they don't want to. Yeah. But no, a dietitian should be able to work within your parameters. Now, they also are going to call you out if you're doing something that is unhelpful. You know, if you're smoking a bunch of marijuana, yeah. drinking too much alcohol, yeah, like yeah. they're obligated to say, listen, these are better choices, blah, blah, blah. But if you yeah. don't like yogurt and they're like, you have to eat yogurt. <laughs> I know any nutrition professional that tells you one food is superior to another, you have to eat one or the other is probably selling you something. So you're right. unlikely to find that in a one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling session with a dietitian. Good. Well, that's good to hear. So the only person that would tell me that I need to eat yogurt is like somebody who's, who has a yogurt that they're trying to sell, <laughs> like a dietitian. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if people ask about baby yogurt all the time and I'm like, Dude, babies can just eat regular yogurt. The people trying to sell you baby yogurt are the ones jacking the price up, not to mention putting added sugar in it. Like did, you don't I need know. baby yogurt. It's I know. wild, I've right? I got just the Stonyfield tub of yogurt for my eight month old and plop it. We don't buy the baby stuff. You know, it's just- You don't need to. Yep. Yogurt. Baby no food, food is, it's an incredible, incredibly massive yeah. part of our economy that like wasn't around a hundred years ago. And I hope it's not around in a hundred years because babies mm -hmm. can eat modified versions of the same foods the rest of their family eats. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Cool. Well, before we start talking, cause I want you to talk about what you do too with baby led weaning. Um, I don't want to forget about your twin pregnancy because oh, you mentioned I never that forget about them. <laughs> you, got, you mentioned that you got pregnant at 18 months or you had them at 18 months. Oh, sorry. They were 18 months old. My quads were 18 months old when my twins were born. Wow. I so you got pregnant. No, it sounds really fast. Enough. I think I was like 40 and I was like, I'll yeah. just start now. Cause it'll probably take a while. And then I did. Yeah. I was so grateful. I had, I had two, I had four embryos left and I was like, I have enough to pay for one transfer. So I hope this works. Um, and we did get pregnant on with IVF with the twins. I mean, I didn't, didn't find the genders out either, but was interesting about the twins. I was, I mean, I was a year and a half older than with the quads. I had no complications with my quadruplet pregnancy, but at, um, I went 38 weeks with my twins and at 32 weeks, I was hospitalized for bleeding. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, you would be the person who has a perfectly fine quadruplet pregnancy. And then a bunch of problems with twins. To be honest, I it was just like, I think it was an iron thing. They gave me IV iron and I was like, this is mu this must be what Superman feels like. Like, you know, iron when you're iron mm -hmm. deficient, like yeah. you don't realize how bad you feel until yeah. you start taking iron. You're like, whoa, I guess I was bad. I felt literally like a superhero, but I also got a three day break. It was like a vacation. The quads weren't allowed to come to the hospital, which I didn't miss their two year old birthday, but I had all my babysitters sending me pictures and I yeah. felt like I was there. Yeah. I think I needed a break. Like, I yeah. think I was getting super Stress. stressed. Yeah. I sat down for three days. It was so relaxing. All my friends came to visit without their kids. It really was like vacation. I mean, I was scared at the same time, but again, I didn't yeah. have control over that. Yeah. And they always tell you not to stress. And you're like, what does that actually mean? But yeah, I was hospitalized for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> had, I went 38 weeks and had one boy and one girl. Wow. And it's funny the the net weight of the babies in the twin pregnancy is exactly the same as it was, was with the quads pregnancy. They were literally like twice as big. Um, they didn't go to the NICU for a month though. So we went right home with those babies. And then that's like wow. when the chaos ensued, like four toddlers trying to touch two babies. And I had had a C-section. I literally locked myself in the room and told my husband, yeah. like, I will see you in six weeks. Like, and at that point we, um, <laughs> we had, um, uh, my mother-in-law came to help us. And then we had had, I had made all these nice grandma friends from having the quadruplets that yeah. they came back to kind of watch the quadruplets. So again, I kind of checked out for six weeks, um, just to like take a break with the babies. Yeah. Cause I feel like with your subsequent pregnancies, you don't do that. And like, I was like, this for sure are, these are the last babies I'm having. And I really want to enjoy the time. And people ask like, was it like, you probably have no problem with twins. And I have to be honest, like having the twins was half as hard as having the quads exactly half it was still hard but it was half as hard like at least yeah. I could feed them by myself like I could they feed three wants. babies at a time but I couldn't do four but I could do two like yeah. no problem so I feel like I actually really enjoyed their infancy period whereas I know a lot of twin moms stress um mine was actually enjoyable because I felt more independent like I could do this by myself yeah that makes sense that makes a lot of sense and so tell me how old are they now the twins just turned three and the quadruplets wow. are five and my oldest wow. is six. Yeah. Wow. So now it's like, I mean, you know, there's a different, yeah. like we just, so at the height, we had six kids in diapers. I had three changing tables. We didn't have a big house. It was just like, we were changing diapers all the time. So I'd be like, yeah. sorry, master bedroom, you are getting a changing table. I just gave away <laughs> my last changing table 
to a friend. She has an 11 year old, a 13 year old, an eight year old, and she's pregnant. And I'm like, why are you doing this again? She's like, I have none of this stuff. So I gave her my last crib. I gave her my last changing table. And it was like, the best feeling ever. I was going to ask you, were you sad about it or were you like, bye? I I (laughs) feel so fortunate because I run a large baby led weaning digital community. I get to see everyone else's babies every day. I don't know how I did it. You could never pay me to go back there again. People joke like, oh, if you had triplets, you would hit for the cycle. I'm like, if I had triplets, like they probably wouldn't have a mom. Cause like, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> think I could do it again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Seriously. Like enough's enough. Um, yeah. I'm sure we'll look back and wonder how we did. It's really fun. And honestly, during COVID having so many kids the same age, close to each other, like I feel really oh. fortunate. They have yeah. each other yeah. um, to play with as opposed to like us going crazy with one kid. So I've always, I'm from a big family. My husband, he's like, I'm from a big family, but I didn't really think I signed up for this. I'm like, well, it's too late to turn back now. So <laughs> we're fine. Um, we enjoy he- it, but it's crazy. So you said you're one of six and what is he? How big is he? He's one of four and interesting. He has an interesting birth story. I'm very close with my mother-in-law and I won't share too much detail, but he was born at 26 weeks in 1975. And their father was military. And um, the only reason he's around is because he was life flighted to a hospital um, where they had care. I mean, he literally like literally had him in a tube sock in like an oven sort of a situation yeah. before they got him to a hospital. And he, um, he's funny. Cause we always joke, I'm a dietitian. I'm a little bit of a, um, he doesn't have the best diet. He'll be the first to tell you that. And whenever <laughs> we talk about diet and exercise, he's like, you realize I am predetermined to overeat. I was premature. My body was deprived of nutrients. I have to eat all of these foods. Like that's his justification for eating more than I would want him to. And I'm like, you know what? You were like 26 weeker in 1975. Like that's cool. He was a pound and his brother was um, oh. very premature as well. So he, he's as a close um, connection with my sister who had two super preemies and those kids, yeah. he's, he's like, I let them do whatever they want in, in my house oh. because, you know, they might not have been here. So, um, yeah. but he's one of four. Um, and I think we had the seven kids so fast kind of before he even like realized what was happening. So well, he's yeah, cool with it now. And sit down basically. I mean, yep. wow. Yeah. Well, that is amazing. Well, Katie, thank you so much for joining me today. Can you, we've talked a little bit about baby led weaning, um, but can you tell us what you do over at your fabulous, awesome Instagram page that I'm obsessed oh, thank with? Thank you. <laughs> well, I am, I run the baby led weaning Instagram page at baby led wean team. I'm the host of a top rated parenting podcast called baby led weaning made easy. It basically have just helped tens of thousands of families give their babies a safe start to solid foods with baby led weaning. So I have a free online workshop. Um, If you go to baby led wean team, it's in, it's all over the place there. And I give everyone on my free workshop, a copy of my hundred first foods list. I created the hundred first foods program when I realized with the quadruplets, we'd done more than a hundred foods by the time they turned one. And we kind of turned it into a digital program. I now co-teach it with another fellow feeding expert. And we just help parents really push their baby's palate because babies can't eat so many more foods than we give them credit for. And it helps prevent picky eating. It helps you raise an independent eater and it, it helps you have fun feeding. Cause I feel like that's what I was missing with my oldest. I was dreading the feeding stuff. And with baby led weaning, it was such a different experience with my quadruplets and my twins. And I just love sharing that with other parents. I love it. Well, we'll, de- we'll definitely add all of that stuff in the show notes page for people to check out all of the good stuff. I'm inter- I'm going to go download your hundred foods right now with my eight, my eight month old. Um, I was talking about him the other day. He's um, he's eight months. Well, a little older than eight months old now. And he's, we did baby led weaning from the start and he was a little bit just wary of it and not super into, and he's still some days, I think he just, it's maybe a texture thing, or I just haven't figured out exactly what we, what he, what his favorite foods are yet. And I'm just, Maybe I'm just like trying too many new foods. No, you've got them. great. You, you can't try too many new foods with okay. your baby. And you are just about to hit what we call the golden age of baby led weaning. Okay. If you've been doing it for eight weeks, generally it starts to yeah. click around the eight or nine month mark okay. where that babies really better. get jammed. And so you hang in there because the first okay. few weeks are slow. It's kind of the biggest secret about baby led weaning. There's okay. no actual eating going on for the yeah. first few weeks. And parents are like, then what am I doing this for? Because yeah. your baby is learning how to eat. So you've got to give them that practice. You are, you're about to hit that sweet spot. Hang in there. 
Okay. That makes me feel better because yeah, the first couple of weeks he, I mean, didn't want anything. I mean, when I say nothing, it was literally nothing. Like he didn't want anything to do with anything. And then finally, what was the first thing? Oh, waffles. I made him some homemade waffles (laughs) and he just really, really liked the waffles. So, and then it was like, okay, we're starting. And now he loves, he loves watermelon. So he's like all about some watermelon and I'll give him last night. I think I gave him tomatoes and he liked that and straw he likes strawberry so he has like a few good ones but it's weird because some days he's like yeah I'm into this and then other days he's like no I'm not really into this so I haven't I just I think he's just still you're probably right he just still needs probably stick with it remember a baby might need to see a food 10 to 15 times before they like or accept it so yeah don't give up you know that you did you do baby led weaning with your first child nope I did not. And I really wanted to do it with Ryland um, because with my first one, I hated, hated sitting down with him and like feeding him and then like trying to eat myself and then like feeding him and like trying to eat myself. And I, when I started to research baby led weaning, I was like, oh, this is great. I can like make our, both of our meals and my older one and my four-year-old all, and we can sit down and I can just watch him while he eats and like you know, be there if he needs help. So I was like really into it. And then of course my expectations were really high. And like the first day I'm like, okay, here's all your stuff. And he's like, you know, and I'm like, ah. I'm going to send you my course <laughs> login stuff. We're going to get, you're not off track, but like you are just <laughs> okay. about for it to all click, but you know, baby led weaning is unique. Cause it is one of the few things that appeals to a second time mom, like first yeah. time mom, they'll buy yeah. everything. And then the second time they're like, huh, I don't need any of that stuff. Yeah. But what I would like to do is take away the picky eating of my older kid. How do I do yes. that? Yes. Baby led weaning helps prevent picky eating. It also helps your toddler get more involved in food preparation. You can yeah. challenge them when the baby's trying new foods, yes. have the toddler explain what it is. Like it's a great way to reconnect with that first child or the older child who might not be super into food is by using baby led weaning since you're, you're doing it anyway with the baby. You're so right. Because Walter loves, he, one of his favorite things to do is like, I'll prep the little plate and he's like, mommy, can I deliver it? Can I give it to, oh, to so Ryland? Cute. I'm like, yes, of course you can. Here you go. And he like and delivers help yourself it. to a bite along the way. Yeah. It's so cute. So yeah, I totally resonate with all of that. And I I'm a big fan, but uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think he just needs like a couple more weeks and he'll kind of really get the swing of things. Our tables actually, we're in the, you know, our new house now and our tables set up differently. So he's at a better, he was at the same high chair before, um, but he's like across from Walter now. And it's just easier to see. So I'm like, I feel like it's just different setting now. It so is because like eating is such a social experience. And is. I know some younger, they won't eat by themselves, especially if they have older siblings, they want the other kid they're eating or the adult yeah. eating with them. So Try not to isolate your baby when they're eating. You're doing the right thing by being at the table with them. Even though I know it's like you got to stop and sit down and eat with them, but we should be sitting down and eating at least two to three times a day ourselves. And if you're not doing that, you maybe want to look at why. So I know your audience is also interested in podcasts. Um, If you want to learn about baby led weaning, my podcast is baby led weaning made easy. If you go online to blwpodcast.com, I do two episodes a week. Monday's a mini baby led weaning training. And then Thursday is always an interview, a guest interview with an expert. I know you're going to be on my podcast. I'm really excited um, to talk to you about that as well. So again, that's blwpodcast.com. Love it. Cool. Well, we will add all of our, all of your stuff into our show notes for people to check it out. Thank you so much, Katie, for joining me today. This was a great episode. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. All right, guys, that wraps up this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and letting me be a part of your motherhood journey. It is truly an honor. If you like what you heard, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And I love hearing what you guys think of the podcast. So if you're liking what you hear or you have a suggestion, I'd be so grateful if you'd go ahead and leave me a review wherever you're listening to help more mamas just like you find the show. That's it for this week on the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. What do you think? Are you starting to feel a little more confident about your pregnancy and birth? Well, if you want more, be sure to head on over to mommylabornurse.com slash podcast for today's show notes and a library of episodes so you can keep getting educated before your upcoming birth. And while you're over there, be sure to check out the blog and learn about our online birth classes. Find it all and more over at mommylabornurse.com slash podcast. See you next week. Same time, same place.